from the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Lamb, there is evidence showing that boys growing up without fathers seem to have problems in the areas of role, in the areas of sex role and gender identity, and there's evidence that comes from the 1990s on that issue, correct? Um, I'm not familiar with research on gender identity issues from the 1990s. Um, uh, well, let's look at uh, tab 19 mm -hmm. uh, of your book. This is uh, the role of the father in child development, and this is your 1997 edition, right? That's right. Okay, and if we turn to uh, page 10, mm -hmm. and we see in the second full paragraph, uh, you talk about, and this is the second to last sentence in that paragraph, uh, chapter, it's describing chapter 11 of the volume. You talk about boys growing up without fathers seem to have problems in the area of sex role and gender identity development, school performance, psychosocial adjustment, and perhaps in the control of aggression. And when you wrote this introduction to your 1997 book, you were describing the state of the art literature, correct? Actually, if you look at this paragraph in context, it specifically refers to the early studies um, uh, and cites then a number of studies, the latest of which um, uh, were the Whitehead and Blankenhorn reviews we talked about earlier. But it's a, um, a reference to the earlier studies. It's trying to put into context the research, and absolutely these topics are discussed by Hetherington and, and um, her co-author. And discussed, you intended your 1997 book to be up-to-date and current, correct? I intended it to be up-to-date and current and to put the results in context, and this paragraph clearly tries to put into context the early father absence studies. That's, that's the, uh, to quote from the um, previous sentence. Now, um, there is increasing evidence that the relationship with the father may have an especially long-term impact on the child's adjustment, particularly as he or she starts to establish mature romantic relationships in adolescence, correct? is correct that children who grow up um, in heterosexual families um, uh, do benefit in those regards when they have a good or good relationship with their fathers and contrarily that there may be difficulties when they don't have a good relationship. That's absolutely correct. And they have some fairly long-term associations between the quality of the relationship that young children have with their fathers and the way that they interact as young adults with their own peers, correct? That's correct. If you look at children being raised in those sorts of families, the quality of the relationships that children have with their parents has uh, short and long-term influences on their development. Now, uh, our expert in this case, David Blankenhorn, wrote a book, uh, Fatherless America, correct. correct? That's correct. And you've read that book, correct? A very long time ago, but I have read it, yes. And you wrote a review of it, correct? I did. And uh, you thought it was easily the most interesting, provocative, and eloquent piece of social commentary published in 1995, correct? Hmm, okay. Um, uh, I, I, I'm glad that I did say that, because I recall it being a, and he certainly perceived it to be a rather negative review of his book. Well, so I am glad. I am glad that I couched my comments politely. Well, well, let, let's look at how you concluded your 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 uh, review, which is behind tab 21, 
and you concluded by saying <coughs> it, meaning the book, deserves to be widely read and thoughtfully discussed. Do you recall saying that? Well, I can see it here. Yes. Your Honor, we move the admission that we ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 103. I assume no objection, Mr. McGill. Right. Very well. And you would concede, in terms of your current views, you would concede that for children who have two parents, those two parents are often quite different in a number of different ways, correct? Yes. And some of those differences between the parents may be related to their gender, correct? Some of them certainly may be, yes. And the point that you would want to emphasize is that you think it's probably beneficial to children to have relationships with people who are different, correct? Yes, but the point that, that I've made repeatedly over time is that um, you know, children benefit from having good quality relationships, but the more different people you have deep intimate relationships with, the better, the, the broader the range of important experiences you can learn. That's certainly true. You would concede that it's not irrelevant for a boy to have a role model insofar as his development is concerned, correct? Um, you said irrelevant, sorry. Sorry, maybe I misspoke. You would concede that it, it's, well, it's relevant for a boy to have a male role model, correct? Both boys and girls do um, uh, copy other people in a variety of ways, and to the extent that, that that's what you mean by having role models, yes, that, that's one way in which children learn about um, different ways of paving. But just so the record's clear, it's, imp it's not irrelevant for a boy to have a male role model insofar as his development is concerned, yes or no? Well, of course, I, I think I just said, children do benefit from and use role models, and society is replete with role models. Um, so that's a yes? Yes. And there is uh, certainly research that talks about the influence on children's gender roles as it relates to the availability of role models outside the home and in society at large, correct? Yes, there is. The, the, the evidence more specifically is on the extent to which children do um, uh, seem to make a great deal of use of role models both inside and outside the home. And, and in your opinion, there isn't any evidence that suggests that it's really important for children to see traditional role modeling between a man and a woman in the home in which they are living, correct? Uh, I usually, whenever I hear the word any, my antenna usually start to wiggle. Um, but, well, let me refresh your recollection. Uh, if you turn to your Howard uh, deposition, mm -hmm. which is in your uh, testimony binder, and uh, that's behind tab four, and I'd like to direct your attention to the deposition at page 50. And let me know when you're there. Mm -hmm. I'm there. Uh, and, and you were, uh, you said, well, you were asked on line 19, do you think it's important for children who are brought into foster care to see traditional role modeling between a man and a woman? Answer, there isn't any evidence that suggests that it's really important to see that in the home in which you're living. And in part, that may be because kids are exposed to so many examples of different forms of, of roles and role models outside the family as well. Did you give that testimony? Yeah, it looks like it. Okay. Um, and uh, when you talk about role models outside the home, you, you would include in that group people on TV could be a, a role model for a boy without a father, right? Yes, I think that that's often what people mean, but I think in, in most Real-world situations, it's often other people that uh, the child comes in contact with, teachers, relatives, friends. And, and uh, assuming all other things being equal, children who have a good relationship with a committed, involved, caring father would do better than those who didn't have that relationship, correct? Yeah, when children do have um, uh, a father, 
having that father involved in their life is very important to their development uh, for the reasons that I explained earlier. Having a mother is also important for child development, isn't it? Having a having a, an important supportive relationship with the people who's taking who are taking care of you is really important. That's correct. Do you think having a mother is important to a child's development? Yes or no? To a child, I, I would have to say it depends. So, so there are some circumstances in which it would be absolutely irrelevant to a child whether uh, they were uh, they were not with their mother. There are certainly some circumstances in which children do perfectly well when they are raised by somebody other than their biological mother. And do, do you, is there a rich empirical literature uh, in your field demonstrating that mothers are irrelevant to the psychological well-being of their children? I think you misstated what I said. I, I'm, I'm asking, asking a question. Um, uh, so, and my question is, I'm not misstating, just asking a question. Is there a rich empirical literature in your field showing that mothers are irrelevant to the psychological well-being of their children? Um, I think one would have to ask what is meant by the term mothers in that context. It's, it's obviously a term that's used to mean a number of different things, uh, and it's important to determine whether you're talking about the uh, person who is uh, biologically uh, conceived bore and deliver the child, or whether you're talking about the person who is playing a key role in the raising of that child and, and affirming a, a social role as a parent. Um, uh, I testified not only here, but in everything that I've written about the importance of the relationships that children have with the people who are taking care of them. Um, and certainly, when that person is a woman and is identified as a mother, that uh, relationship is a supremely important uh, element in shaping that child's development. By the same token, we know that, that the gender of that person is not the important factor that makes that person an important contributor to that child's development. Now, uh, in your report, in this case, you made reference to a traditional family. Do you recall that? Yes, I did. And, and a traditional family, as you were using that term, was a, fair, a family with a married biological mother and father. Is that right? Well, I, I think uh, I usually mean a um, broadly, a broader than that, um, cases where there's not only a, a bio married um, family with a biological mother and father, but the term usually refers also to the ways in which children are reared, with a stay-at-home mother, um, a breadwinning father, with the early child care predominantly uh, provided within the home, and anything that would involve a, a deviation in some respects from those would be seen as a non-traditional family. And there are some elements of society broadly defined that still assume that a traditional family is best for children, correct? Uh, I think that there are probably um, uh, elements in society who might believe that, yes. And even among social scientists, there is a diversity of opinion about those factors, correct? Well, I think that the, um, uh, the consensus among, um, in the field is that family structure variables like those are not causally important in identifying um, or affecting children's adjustment. I'd like to ask you a few questions about the importance between the genetic link between ch parent and child. Certainly we know that personality or temperament is something that is under genetic influence. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. And there are similarities between genetic parents and their offspring with respect to some of those factors, correct? There can be similarities. Of course, since people have two biological parents who may be differ on a characteristic, it's quite common for the offspring's characteristics to be like those of neither of the parents, um, but a blend. It is also quite common for a child to be like one parent and, and unlike the other. Um, uh, so it's certainly not the case that, that children are always uh, similar to their biological parents with respect to temperamental personality although that's certainly one of the um, factors that influence those things. And, and, and those similarities between genetic parents and their offspring would influence ch 
children's adjustment, correct? If there were similarities between parents and children, it might influence the, um, the child's adjustment in a variety of ways. Um, usually those differences themselves wouldn't represent differences in adjustment. Those would be normal variations in temperament or personality. But you could conceive of a situation where somebody's uh, temperament, um, something that makes them irritable, um, uh, makes them impatient, uh, that, that might affect their parenting. And so in that way, it, it might affect the child's adjustment. Um, when I, you said it might affect the adjustment just now, let's look at what you said during your deposition. I'd like to direct your attention to Binder 1, uh, mm -hmm. your deposition in this case, which is behind Tab 1, mm -hmm. and it's page 257, and let me know when you're there. Okay. All right, and line 7. Certainly we know that personality or temperament is something that is under genetic influence. And there are similarities between genetic parents and their offspring with respect to some of those sorts of factors. And those would influence children's adjustment. So genetic factors in that sense are significant issues to take into account when trying to understand children's adjustment. You gave that testimony. Yeah. All right. Um, now, I'd like to uh, ask you some questions about the importance of family structure. You would agree that marriage is correlated with some of the child outcomes described in your report, correct? Yes, it's certainly correlated with them. And the ways in which marriage is associated with those outcomes are complicated, varied both in, uh, varied in both direct and indirect pathways of influence, correct? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, and let's look at another type of family structure, a reconstituted family. Uh, would you agree that there's a fairly substantial body of evidence suggesting that the addition of a stepfather into the home is often not a positive event for children and that it affects the dynamics within the home in negative ways? That, that's certainly true, yes. But you don't think family structure affects family processes, correct? Well, in, in, in that particular example, the um, difference in the family structure would be associated with the process, that is the entry of the stepfather in trying to establish relationships with the children would set and train various kinds of, of important relationships that may have both positive or negative influences on children. It changes the dynamics of the relationships between the resident mother and the child as she tries to change the um, dynamics within that family. So in that, that, that situation, there clearly would be a correlation between the structure and those important processes. Do you think there's a, uh, that family structure matters as between a uh, married biological family and a cohabiting family? Those two structures would have any impact on the process? Of well, you'd have to look at the processes um, and have to understand what is happening in those different families. This, and the, um, you know, the evidence shows that it's those within the family processes that are ultimately uh, important in shaping those children's adjustment. So as between a married biological family and a cohabiting family, you don't think family structure affects family processes, correct? Well, it may be correlated with family processes, and I just tried to explain what I meant by that in my response to your previous question. Well, uh, just to uh, refresh your recollection, I'd like to turn your attention to your deposition in the Cole case. This is a deposition you gave about five weeks ago, is that right? Or four weeks, yeah? Yeah, recent. Okay, uh, this is behind tab three, uh, page 93. And tell me when you're there, Dr. Lee. I'm there. Okay, it says, how does the married biological family structure affect family processes? This is line 15, sorry. How does the married biological family structure affect family processes in a way different from cohabiting couple, where only... I can't find this. So on page 93? Yes, line 15.
of the coal deposition? Yeah, I have line 15 is in the middle of an answer by me. Somebody I've got something wrong. Page 93? Yes. Which is on transcript page 24? Yes, sir. Well, we can, we can uh, return to that maybe at the break. I'll, I'll check and make sure our binders are all on the same page. Um, but it, it was a question that actually started on line 18, at uh, 13. Okay, now I have it now. Okay. Oh, you have it now? Okay. okay. All right. Uh, so as I was saying, line 15. It, uh, how does the married biological family structure affect family processes in a way different from cohabiting couple where only one parent is related to the child affect family processes? Objection form. Answer. I don't think family structure affects family processes. You gave that testimony, right? Okay. Now, um, if we were to randomly look at a thousand married heterosexual couples and then compare them with a random selection of a thousand cohabiting couples, you would find a difference if we didn't hold constant for other factors that are related to relationship quality, correct? And if we did not control for those, yes, you probably would. Uh, I'd like to direct your attention to tab, uh, binder 2, tab 22. This is a uh, report by the Child Trends Research uh, Group, uh, and it's uh, written by Kristen Anderson Moore, uh, and she uh, is a uh, she works at uh, Child Trends and uh, has won. Were you aware that she's won the American Sociological Association Distinguished Contribution Award? I wasn't aware of that, but okay. I'm pleased. She certainly deserves it. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 26. Well, um, I think the witness can be asked about the article, whether it will be admitted into evidence maybe in other matters. So, uh, well, Your Honor, if I just may respond to that with two points. First of all, we withdrew Dr. Marks and the other experts because of the concerns about the video recording. Uh, as the court will note, they were withdrawn on the eve of trial before we had the stay from the Supreme Court. They were extremely concerned about their personal safety and did not want to appear with any recording of any sort uh, whatsoever. And uh, so that's one issue. But second and apart from that is there's no limitation on the court's ability to take judicial notice of this sort of material. It's precisely the sort of thing that the Supreme Court and Brown and Roe and Grutter and Lawrence took judicial notice of. So we would well, and there's nothing that prevents you from putting this document before the witness and getting his reaction to it. Okay. That's what yeah. I'm suggesting that yeah. you do. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, very well. Um, all right. Uh, so now uh, turning to uh, page, uh, let's see, it's the second page of this document, what we've, uh, and it's um, at the last carryover sentence. Uh, she, she talks about the author state, it is not simply the presence of two parents, as some have assumed, but the presence of two biological parents, and, and they've italicized two biological parents, that seems to support children's development. You didn't even consider this document when you put together your first report, did you? I don't know whether I considered it or not. I've certainly seen it. It's a research review um, uh, put together by these um, very well respected people um, as a public education document. It's not a scholarly publication, although um, it, it does review such scholarly work. Um, uh, it's primarily designed to contribute to the um, 
to the popular um, understanding of these issues. Um, if you and so I, I'm not. I, I want to make clear that while I may not have cited it, it's certainly not something that I would want to distance myself from. Um, uh, it's also clear that that what it provides is a review of the research on the adjustment of children um, uh, being raised by heterosexual parents, and it focuses on reviews and summarizes research um, that concerns the adjustment of children who. Um, uh, have been born to heterosexual parents and grow up in either uh, two-parent families with those biological parents or in families um, where they were only with one of those biological parents. And I believe, and I haven't had a chance to reread it, it probably also talks about the effects of their parenthood. So one has to put that in context, and in that context, I think that, that um, the particular summary statement that, that you read um, seems to be a reasonable summary of it. Um, I would say that, that this article um, uses uh, causal language probably more often than I think is warranted, and I suspect that that's because it was written not for an academic audience, but primarily as a public education document. Um, Your Honor, we would renew our request that the t court take judicial notice. And I would add that this is a material that Mr. Blankenhorn considered and will testify to. And Mr. McGill and his colleagues will be able to cross-examine uh, Mr. Blankenhorn about this. So we, we'd renew our request. Very well. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, uh, w uh, um, Dr. Lamb, I'd like to turn your attention to the next tab in Binder 2, tab 23. This is an article entitled, The Impact of Family Formation Change on the Cognitive, Social, and Emotional Well-Being of the Next Generation by Paul Amato. And uh, Professor Amato is well-respected, is he not? He absolutely is, yes. Okay. And this is uh, DIX2. Your Honor, we request that judicial notice be taken of DIX2. Very well. All right. And uh, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Lamb, turning uh, your attention to um, page 89 of this document, and to the bottom of the uh, left-hand column where it says, uh, and let me know when you're there. Yes, yeah, since I'm having trouble. It's um, 89, bottom of the left-hand column. The yes, general sir. conclusion? Yes, sir. Yeah. It, it says, research clearly demonstrates that children growing up with two continuously married parents are less likely than other children to experience a wide range of cognitive, emotional, and social problems, not only during ch childhood, but also in adulthood. Do you agree with that statement? Um, that is a summary of the research that he has reviewed here. And again, the important thing to remember is that, that he's reviewing um, uh, large-scale studies of children being raised by heterosexual parents in various family uh, configuration. And he concludes that paragraph by saying, this distinction is even stronger if we focus on children growing up with two happily married biological parents. And has he accurately summarized the literature in your opinion? I think that's entirely consistent with what I testified about the importance of the relationships between the individuals raising a child. So that would be a yes, he accurately summarized the literature? Yes. Sorry. Uh, turning your attention to tab 24, this is uh, a document uh, by the Institute for American Values uh, entitled The Consequences of Marriage for African Americans, a Comprehensive Literature Review, um, and it's uh, DIX 107. Your Honor, we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of this document. Your Honor. Well, Your, Your Honor, we would say, as we've said before, that uh, the judicial notice provisions permit the court to take cognizance of 
these documents for the truth of the matter asserted, which is what the Supreme Court has done many times. Well, I'll take judicial notice of the uh, document, and you can inquire of the witness with respect to whatever portion of it you wish to do so. I appreciate that, Your Honor. Okay, uh, turning your attention to page 54, Dr. Lamb. Let me know when you're there. Okay, uh, 154. And in the sixth paragraph, uh, it reads, For African-American children, parental marriage produces important benefits. Black children of married parents typically enjoy better infant health, receive better parenting, are less delinquent, have fewer behavioral problems, have higher self-esteem, are more likely to delay sexual activity, and have moderately better educational outcomes. These findings almost certainly reflect more than correlations. Marriage itself appears to be contributing strongly to better outcomes for black children. Does this uh, statement accurately summarize the state of the literature on African-American families? Um, I wouldn't want to say that I'm familiar with all the research on, on African-American families, and I'm not familiar with this particular report, so I don't know what research that it's summarized. Um, again, I would suggest that, that um, uh, it is on rather shaky grounds when it proposes the fact that this likely reflects more than mere correlations. All right, I'd like to turn your attention to uh, your next tab in your binder, which is DIX 113. This mm -hmm. is an article by William Doherty and others entitled Responsible Fathering, an Overview and Conceptual Framework. And uh, Professor Doherty is well respected, is he not? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Your Honor, we uh, ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 113. Very well. All right. And turning your attention, uh, Dr. Lamb, to page 286 uh, and the right-hand column. <coughs> the authors uh, conclude in the last uh, sentence uh, on, in that second full paragraph on the right-hand column, we conclude that in practice, the kind of mother-father relationship... Sorry, so, okay. Oh. I don't know what's the matter with me today, but I keep not finding your things. We're in the right-hand column on 285. 286. Okay. And second full paragraph. Yes. And then the last sentence or last two senses. Are you there, sir? Okay, yes, oh, yeah. I'm okay. sorry. No problem. Uh, we conclude that in practice, the kind of mother-father relationship most conducive to responsible fathering in contemporary U.S. society is a caring, committed, collaborative marriage. Outside of this arrangement, substantial barriers stand in the way of active, involved fathering. Does this statement accurately summarize the literature? It accurately summarizes the literature that they're talking about, which is studies of heterosexual um, parents raising children. Yes. All right. And let's turn to the next tab in your binder, tab 26. This is another report by the Institute for American Values. It's DIX 38, and we would ask the court to take uh, judicial notice of DIX 38. Very well. And um, turning your attention, Dr. Lamb, to page 32 of this report. Under the conclusion, are you there? Yep. Okay. It says in the second paragraph under conclusion, but marriage matters. Children in average intact married families do better than children in average single and step-parent families. Do you agree with that statement? Um, uh, on average, yes, I think that's, that's true, okay, as I've, I've testified earlier. I'd like to direct your attention to the next tab in your binder 27, which is DIX 121. This is a document from the Progressive Policy Institute entitled, Putting Children First. Before you go on to that, um, yes. 
he asked the witness with reference to the statement that counsel has referred you to in DIX 38. Is that statement based upon evidence drawn from opposite sex couples? Uh, not to my knowledge. So this would include same-sex couples? I believe it does not. Not. Yes, correct. So I'm sorry. Based solely upon uh, studies evidence of, drawn from studies of opposite sex couples. Is that correct? I believe that's true. Yes. I, I, I'm not familiar with this document, um, but the you know it's the Institute for American Values is a is a um, lobbying group um, uh, that promotes a, a particular view of marriage, and most of their focus has been on um, promoting marriage among heterosexual couples. And I believe that, that um, the research that they reviewed, as I, as I quickly spin through it, seems to involve studies of such families. Well, now, just uh, you say this is a lobbying group. Uh, I'd like to direct your attention to the second page of this document. It says, this statement comes from a team of family scholars chaired by Brad Wilcox of the University of Virginia. And the University of Virginia is a distinguished university, is it not? Yes, it is. And uh, William Doherty, who you just said is well-respected, also was a co-author, correct? Well, if, if you say so. Uh, and it also lists Norval Glenn of the University of Texas. He's highly regarded in his field, is he not? I think he's regarded highly in the field, yes. He's, he's quite ideologically committed. But he's highly regarded as a talented sociologist, is that correct? I, I'm not a sociologist. I've certainly heard his name. Okay. Um, are, are you familiar with the sociological literature on parenting? Or are you focused only on the psychological literature? No, I've tried to um, cover the sociological and demographic literature as well, as you know from our previous discussions and from my report. But let's turn to uh, uh, back to DIX 121, which was uh, behind uh, tab 27. Uh, it's Putting Children First, a Progressive Family Policy for the 1990s, um, and it's DIX 121, and we would ask the court to take judicial notice of this document. Very well. And uh, turning to page two, uh, Dr. Lamb, in the second full paragraph, second sentence from the bottom, it says, as we will see, a large body of evidence supports the conclusion that in the aggregate, the intact two-parent family is best suited to the task of, it is a, to this task, but it's raising children. Would you agree that the intact two-parent family is best suited to the task of raising children? Well, I think it depends. If, if you're talking about um, uh, the, you know, again, this is making reference to the research we've talked about a lot today, showing that uh, on average, uh, children being raised by two married heterosexual parents do better than children being raised by uh, single or divorced heterosexual parents. And I, I'd like to direct your attention to tab 28, uh, which is, Growing Up with a Single Parent, What Hurts, What Helps, by Sarah McClanahan and Gary Sandifer. Uh, Sarah McClanahan is a professor at Princeton University, is that right? Yeah, she wrote this when she was at Wisconsin, but she's at Princeton now. And yeah. she is a very highly respected in her field, is that right? Yes. Yeah. All right. And um, this is DIX 124, and we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 124. Oh. And uh, direct this, uh, are you familiar with this study, uh, Dr. Lamb? Yes, I am. And this was based on a very large uh, set of data, is that correct? That's correct. And um, turning your attention to uh, page one, the italicized portion. Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, in the second paragraph, the italics start. Children who grow up in a household with only one biological parent are worse off, on average, 
than children who grow up in a household with both of their biological parents, regardless of the parent's race or educational background, regardless of whether the parents are married when the child is born, and regardless of whether the resident parent remarries. And is that an accurate statement of the literature? That's an accurate summary of the studies that they did here, which involved comparing children being raised by heterosexual parents in different family configurations. Do you know of any study of comparable size that reaches a contrary conclusion? No. And um, I'd like to direct your attention to uh, tab 30 in your binder. And this is uh, entitled Adolescent Well-Being in Cohabiting Married and Single Parent Families. Uh, it's DIX 21, uh, and it's produced by Wendy Manning and Kathleen Lamb. I take it that's no relation? No relation. Okay. Uh, and, uh, Your Honor, we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 21. Very well. And this was, uh, you can see in the second sentence, Dr. Lamb, this had a sample size of 13,231 families. Is that right? Um, well, that was the si sa sample size for the whole of the uh, era, that health sample. Okay. There weren't that many being raised by cohabiting or in step families. All right. And, and turning your attention to uh, page 890 of this uh, document, Under discussion, it, it states in the uh, second sentence, which uh, adolescents in married two biological parent families generally fare better than children in any of the family types examined here, including single mother, cohabiting stepfather, and married stepfather families. The advantage of marriage appears to exist primarily when the child is the biological offspring of both parents. Do you know of any study of comparable size that reaches a different conclusion? Now, all of the um, literature uses Well, these give me a yes or no, please, and then you can go on. Um, uh, no, there are all of the research on... I was trying to give you a broader answer, that all of the research that involves focusing on children raised by heterosexual parents in different family configurations gives you essentially the same conclusion. Now, I'd like to uh, direct your attention to tab 31, and this is uh, a document uh, co-authored by Sarah McClanahan of Princeton University and Cynthia Harper. It's called Father Absence and Youth Incarceration, and it's DIX uh, 116, and, Your Honor, we uh, ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 116. Very well. And turning your attention, uh, Dr. Lamb, to the first page, uh, page 369, it says in the fourth, starting in the fourth sentence, results from longitudinal event history analysis showed that although a sizable portion of the risk that appeared to be due to father accidents could actually be attributed to other factors such as teen motherhood, low parent education, racial inequalities, and poverty, adolescents in father absent households still faced elevated incarceration risk. The adolescents who faced the highest incarceration risk, however, were those in step parent families, including father stepmother families. Do you know of any study uh, of equal size to this one that reached a contrary conclusion? No. All right. With the same qualifications. I'd like to direct your attention to tab 32 in your binder. This is a study by Susan Brown entitled Family Structure and Child Well-Being, the Significance of Par Parental Cohabitation, DIX-8. And, Your Honor, we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX-8. Very well. And turning your attention, Dr. Lamb, to page 364, and I should first ask, this was a very large sample size, is that uh, right? Well, it was drawn from a large national sample, but I think the actual uh, study focuses on a relatively small number of individuals. Um, which is, is that a potential problem? 
No, it's not a potential problem. I'm just um, clarifying in response to your question. Okay. Uh, now, under discussion, the left-hand column, this is a very long paragraph. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Page. Oh, sorry, uh, Your Honor, page uh, 364. <coughs> left-hand column, let's do it from the back, one, two. Uh, the third uh, sentence from the bottom, it, it reads, uh, adolescents living in cohabiting step families have significantly higher levels of behavioral and emotional problems and lower levels of school engagement on average than those in two biological parent married families. And you don't know of any study of comparable size that reaches a different conclusion, correct? Not involving adolescents, no. All right, I'd like to direct your attention to tab 33, and uh, this is a study by Paul Amato uh, entitled Parental Absence During Childhood and Depression in Later Life, uh, and Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 103. Very well. And um, uh, Dr. Lamb, turning your attention to the summary, uh, at the beginning uh, of this document, it's the second page of the exhibit, uh, Professor Amato states in the second sentence, whites and African Americans, male and female, separated from a parent, score higher on a measure of depression than those raised in continuously intact families. And is that consistent with your understanding of the findings of the social literature? As it is, yes. Uh, page reference again, please. Oh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, that is the, it's page uh, 543. Thank you. Yes, sir. And, um, Professor, turning your attention to tab 34, which is uh, a document authored by Bruce Ellis. It's called, Does Father Absence Place Daughters at Special Risk for Early Sexual Activity and Teenage Pregnancy? Uh, and this is DIX 114. And, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 114. And um, if we look at the uh, first sentence of the summary on the next page, which is page 801, do you see, Dr. Lamb, that it says, the impact of father absence on early sexual activity and teenage pregnancy was investigated in longitudinal studies in the United States and New Zealand. And those N numbers of 242 and 520, that represent the sample size, is that right? That's correct. All right, and then I'd like to uh, direct your attention to uh, page 818, 818. It's the very last paragraph of the uh, report. And it, it, it says, uh, tell me when you're there, sir. I'm there. Okay. Uh, it says, in conclusion, father absence was an overriding risk factor for early sexual activity and adolescent pregnancy. Do you know of any study of comparable size that reaches a different conclusion? Well, actually, this is a, an interesting one for you to raise because in the most recent issue of child development, there is another paper um, focused on precisely this question um, uh, designed to address the one weakness that these authors themselves acknowledge in their uh, discussion here, which is the fact that they weren't able to control for um, the possibility that there were genetic differences, uh, ones that we talked about earlier in this discussion. That analysis um, uh, by Mendel and his colleagues um, makes clear that this conclusion was incorrect and that those differences had to do not with father absence but with the differences in the um, inherited dispositions of the individuals in the study. And uh, was that study uh, of comparable size the one? Do you, do you know what the uh, sample size was? I don't remember the, the sample size. No. Okay. Um, all right, I'd like to direct your attention to uh, the next tab, which is tab 35. This is a document entitled The Prevalence and Seriousness 
of incestuous <coughs> abuse. Stepfathers versus biological fathers. DIX 133. Uh, and it's authored by Diana Russell. Uh, Your Honor, we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 133. Very well. And turning your attention, uh, Dr. Lamb, to uh, the first page of the report, in the abstract, it's, it states, an analysis of interviews obtained from a random sample of 930 adult women in San Francisco revealed that 17% or one out of every six women who had a stepfather as a principal figure in her childhood years was sexually abused by him. The comparable figures for biological fathers were 2%. Do you know of any study of comparable size that has reached a contrary conclusion to this one? Well, there's been much more work on the incidence of sexual abuse, and this was quite an early study. Um, None of it contradicts the conclusion that, that um, girls are at greater risk of abuse by um, stepfathers. But I think the specific figures have been uh, put into question. And with the uh, court's permission, we'd like to uh, pass out volume three of our binders today. Can I put away the previous ones? Well, not in one, but, uh, okay. not your prior testimony, but you may put away two. Very well, how many more binders do we have? With we're, we're, we're halfway home, Your Honor. Dr. Lamb, you, you would, uh, I'd like to say, change topics now from uh, the biological parenting to uh, talk for a moment about divorce. Uh, and divorce typically has painful adverse effects on mothers, fathers, and their children, correct? Yeah. That's correct, as a summary. Isn't it true there is, a, there is substantial evidence that children with divorced parents score more poorly than do children with married parents with respect to many aspects of psychological adjustment and well-being? On average, yes. That's what I testified earlier. Uh, and, and unfortunately, stepfathers typically do not develop authoritative relationships with their children either, so most of these children are doubly disadvantaged, correct? That's often the case, yes. On average, children whose parents had, who whose parents were divorced are more likely to be maladjusted than children whose parents have not divorced, correct? That's correct. Many gay fathers have children in the context of heterosexual relationships before coming out, correct? Uh, that was certainly true. I'm uh, unclear to what extent that that's the case today. Difficulties faced by their children involve coming to terms with the sexual orientation of their fathers, correct? That's certainly reported in some cases, yes. And the majority of lesbian couples who have children have them as a result of heterosexual relationships, correct? Again, I think that used to be true. I, I'm not um, in possession of, of the, the data to suggest whether that's still the case. For those whom it is true for, those children would have suffered the trauma of divorce or the death of a parent, correct? Presumably so, yes. Now, I'd like to uh, you, you, uh, switch gears again. You've talked about the rich literature of same-sex parenting, and uh, I want to delve into uh, exactly how rich this literature is and start with some general questions. Um, it, it's sort of standard practice within a study to look closely at the sample and closely at the methods, correct? Yes. Any individual small study is always potentially suspect, correct? I would say that any individual study is always potentially suspect, yes. 
And if a study uh, takes who's ever available, you would call that a non-random sample, correct? That's right. Um, no, none of the uh, studies on gay parenting rely on a random sample of the gay and lesbian population in the United States, correct? Um, well, that, that's not entirely true, no. Um, which, which study it draws on a random sample of all gay and lesbian individuals in the United States? Well, I'm only interested, of course, in those who are raising children, so I presume that that's what you meant in your question. Well, this, let's start with the first proposition. There's no study that can speak to the parenting abilities of gays and lesbians who don't have children, correct? In the entire United States? Right. That I can think of now. Okay. And with respect to those uh, same-sex couples, who do have children, is there any study that purports to be a random sample uh, nationally of same, opposite, excuse me, same-sex couples in the United States? Well, the, the closest that would come would not be a random sample. It would be an analysis of the U.S. Census data. Um, uh, that doesn't have to be a sample. It includes the entire population. And there are now data drawn from the, the U.S. Census with respect to children's adjustment in the care of gay and lesbian parents. Yes, but it's, they don't purport to be a random sample of the entire U.S. population of same-sex couples, correct? No, you don't have a random sample when you sample the entire population. You have the population. Right, right, a random sample of that population. None of them purport to be that, do they? Um, well, I would... I think most of us would consider this to be better. Uh, uh, which study purports to be a random sample of the entire population of same-sex couples in the United States with children? I said that I don't know that there is one that is a random sample of all gays and lesbians in the United States. Well, my question just now was uh, gays and lesbians with children. Correct. Okay, do you know of any study that purports to be, reflect a random sample of all gay and lesbian couples in the United States who are raising children? Yes or no? Um, we may be getting confused, and I don't, I don't want to be argumentative. We have one study that involves looking at all gays and lesbian couples in the United States raising children. So it's not a sample, it's a population analysis. And we have um, another series of studies conducted by um, uh, Wainwright and Patterson that involve a focus on um, children being raised by um, lesbian mothers drawn from a nationally representative sample of um, uh, teenagers, 12 to 18 year olds in the United States. So it's not representative of all gays and lesbians raising children. It's, it's representative of that population um, with children in that particular age range. And which is the study that uh, is drawn from the U.S. Census data? It's a study by um, uh, Rosenfeld, um, uh, which is to appear in a journal called Demography which is to appear in a journal of demography. So you haven't, that's not something you've disclosed in your expert materials in this case, correct? Um, I don't think so, no. Okay. Um, now, uh, do, do you know uh, what percentage of male same-sex couples in the United States have a child? Well, there are, there are varied estimates out there, um, uh, and I, I'm not the figure that, that comes to mind is somewhere around 20%, but I'm not sure of that particular figure. Okay, well, let's look at uh, tab 38 of your binder. Uh, this is PX 1030. Okay. It's a APA policy statement on sexual orientation, parents and children, um, and it says in the first sentence, many lesbians and gay men are parents. In, in, 2000, in the 2000 U.S. Census, 33% of female same-sex couples' households and 22% of male same-sex couple households 
reported at least one child under the age of 18. So that's consistent with your understanding. All right. Um, I said yes. Sorry. And there's uh, most of the studies listed in your materials considered addressed uh, lesbians. Is that correct, as parents, not as opposed to gay men? Most of the studies do. That's correct. And there's much less research on gay fathers, primarily because there are many few fewer gay fathers than there are lesbian mothers who are living with and raising their children. Correct. Um, I think that was certainly true initially, and also gay fathers were much more difficult to to locate. Uh, and uh, the lesbians that have been studied tend to be better off than average, correct? Better off financially? Yes, yes, Your Honor, thank you. Um, uh, I don't know about that. Um, well, uh, all right, we, we'll explore that later. Um, I'd like to direct your attention to uh, tab 39, which is uh, a document called Who's Gay Community, Social Class, Sexual Self-Expression, and Gay Community invo Involvement from the Sociological Quarterly. And I'd like to direct your attention to page 454. Apologize, I'm just looking for the place. Um, let, let me um, ask you uh, it, it this way, Professor. Would, would you admit that um, one obvious concern brought up by uh, trying to research gays and lesbians is that uh, you're confined to a sample of those who in some ways identify themselves as gay and lesbian? Yes. And, and uh, would you agree that there's some suggestion that the samples that are drawn tend to be from the experiences of middle class uh, gay and lesbian individuals and don't reflect the full totality of the gay and lesbian community? No, that wouldn't be true. All right, well, let's, let's look at um, 39A, uh, which is the next tab in your binder. And I'd like to, uh, th this is a document called Appearances Can Be Deceptive, Self-Selection, Social Group Identification, and Political Mobilization. And it's authored by Scott Gardner and Gary Segura. Professor Segura will be testifying next week on behalf of the plaintiffs. This is DIX 1100, uh, and we would ask the court to take uh, judicial notice of this document. Very well. <clears throat> All right. Um, and. Uh, Turning to page uh, 133, let me know when you're there. Yes. Okay. Uh, and specifically, uh, looking um, at the second to last paragraph where it says, uh, full paragraph, and this is in the third uh, full sentence, it says, if the ability to mobilize is one of the incentives for identification, then the okay. individual... Yes, okay. If the ability to mobilize is one of the incentives for identification, then the individuals we observe from invisible groups are likely to be more politically active than visible groups. That is, there is a selection effect. Those repressed invisible minorities who allow us to see them do so for a reason, and this reason tells us something about their likely behavior. Isn't there a... Uh, isn't Professor Segura right about this point that the sorts of individuals who are willing to step forward and volunteer to be in these studies are not necessarily representative of the overall uh, gay and lesbian community? Well, I, I obviously don't know this literature that's being discussed here. I'm here to talk about child adjustment, and as far as I can tell, this paper has nothing to do with, with parents. Um, uh, certainly, gays and lesbians who are raising children um, uh, are already visible, and those groups tend to be are, are the ones that I've been concerned with. Yes. Uh, all right. 
Uh, now let's uh, turn to uh, tab 41 of your binder. And, and Your Honor, we are uh, at a, a logical breaking point, but I'm, I'm happy to continue on whatever the court's pleasure is. A logical breaking point is as good as any. So <laughs> <laughs> why don't we then logically break for lunch? And I'll see you at 1 o'clock. Thank you.